Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Educational AD Podcast. Before we meet today's guest, we want to give a shout out to our partners, the Global Community of Women in High School Sports, Vital Signs Wall of Fame, We Coach, and the Florida Coaches Coalition. These are four great organizations. You should really add them to your network. And now, don't hit that fast forward button. Stay with us for the next three minutes as we give our sponsors their shout outs. These are all products that I used as a coach or as an athletic director. You should be using them too. Here we go. We want to thank Home Campus for their support. Home Campus is the exclusive high school and state association platform for the podcast. It's also your one-stop platform for scheduling, student athlete eligibility and clearance, and a whole lot more. As an AD, I used Home Campus every single day, and it was just great. To find out more about what Home Campus could do for you and your program, just go to homecampus.com. That's homecampus.com. We also want to say thanks to Gipper. Go to gipper.com. Start creating world-class marketing content for your school's social media channel. It's so easy. Even I can do it. Celebrate your athletes and promote your teams. Mention the podcast. You'll get a nice discount. That's gipper.com. We also want to say thanks to Huddle. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years, but when I became an athletic director, I made sure our school was a Huddle school, and our coaches just loved the tools that Huddle provided that helped them coach our kids to their highest levels. At Huddle, we believe in sports, and teams believe in Huddle. Join the 6 million users and turn your school into a Huddle school. We also want to say thanks to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. You know they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. Check out their interactive touchscreen video consoles. It's a great way to display your school records, your Hall of Fame, or just to tell more compelling stories and celebrate your school's diverse history and your proudest moments. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. We also want to say thank you to District 1. Go to district1.com. That's W-O-N. And you're going to feel like you've won when you see their custom uniforms, their on-time delivery, and their one-at-a-time replacement program. You're never going to have to buy a full set of uniforms again when you just need one or two replacements. Go to district1.com. Click on the team gear button. You'll get a free quote. That's district1.com. We want to say thank you to Hometown Ticketing, the leading digital ticketing provider to schools and colleges. Hometown Ticketing is digital ticketing that offers more, more support, more security, more customization. Hometown is here to make the best solution for you. Go to hometownticketing.com and get signed up today. We want to say thank you to Snap Mobile. Go to snapraise.com. Check out their entire suite of platforms designed to help you do your job better. If you're looking for a fundraiser, stop. Snap Raise is hands down the best fundraiser out there. But there's also Snap Store, Snap Manage, Snap Connect, and more. You'll find them all at snapraise.com. We want to say thanks to Sideline Interactive indoor score tables and video boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com and schedule a live web demo and see their score tables and their score boards in action. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive indoor scoring table. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Get signed up today. We also want to say thanks to Athletic Surveys by Lifetrack. Athletic Surveys are a quick, easy, and affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire program. Athletic directors already hear from the complainers, the 2% that want to gripe about everything. Athletic Surveys will connect you with the 2%, but they'll also connect you with the 98% that love and support your program. That's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with that frustrated parent, your principal, or even your school board. Go to athleticsurveys.com. Let them show you how they can create a custom survey that'll let you take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. That's athleticsurveys.com. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Educational AD Podcast. We are going international today. We're going all the way to England, and we're going to be visiting with Jenny Fielding. Jenny is the director of women's health for an organization called Joint Dynamics Evolve. I came across Jenny's um, 
uh, platform. Uh, she's going to be presenting at a webinar that's coming up in September. So as you're listening to this, you still have time to sign up for the webinar. Um, and the webinar is going to be on optimizing adolescent female health education. So uh, I thought she'd be a great guest for our listeners. I know many of you are still in the classroom or you're working with coaches who still teach. So uh, uh, sit back. I think we're going to have a great episode, uh, but let's do this. Jenny Fielding, welcome to the Educational AD Podcast. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's a real privilege to be invited and um, that we've connected one of the great things, I guess, nowadays in the post-COVID era is how easy it is to connect internationally and electronically. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for for hearing about us and for giving me the opportunity to speak. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I, I, you and I talked about this. It was uh, we had some minor hurdles to, to get this scheduled, but I'm glad we were able to get it ready to go for listeners we're recording this in late July. So it's going to be very timely by the time you hear it. Jenny, we always like to let our listeners have a chance to get to know our guests. So give us that quick bio, you know, where you were born, where you grew up, you know, maybe take us up through your own, uh, you know, university years, and then we'll take a break and, and hear more about your early career. But what's the Jenny Fielding origin story? Um, not that exciting, probably. Um, so I grew up in the UK. Um, I have um, two sisters and a brother. Um, went to school and did pretty well at school, then went to college and did pretty badly at college. Um, and then I resat my A-levels um, because I was desperate to get into physiotherapy school um, and I didn't originally with my A-level results. Um, at school, I actually thought I wanted to be a special educational needs teacher um, and I did my work experience in that environment, um, which I loved. But when I was there, there was a physiotherapist that came in um, and she was just amazing. And I wish I knew what her name was now because I'd love to thank her for my career. But at the time, I don't think I realized how pivotal the change was. Um, but she did, you know, a really amazing job. But also her job was practical and um, interesting. The kids seemed the most engaged they were in their entire school week. Um, and at that point onwards, it just kind of, I guess, was my first exposure into the world of physiotherapy. Um, and so when I finally did get in, um, then, yeah, then that was kind of where where it had come from I guess and and the career I have now is probably different to the one I would have imagined um in the field but that's what's so great I think about physiotherapy is it's really varied and there's lots of options um yeah in terms of a bit about me I guess um I've always been in the UK and um lived here until 2000 and 15. Um, I did a couple of years traveling with my job before that, but was still based in the UK. Spent the last eight years in Hong Kong um, and have now just returned back to London um, with my three children. So ready for a very different chapter, which I'm sure will look a bit different. Uh, yeah, well, the, the traveling thing really intrigues me, but um, I want to go back to your school experience. Now, um, I have actually been to England many, many times. I was part of a group of uh, American football coaches. We would bring players, uh, high school players over, and we'd tour and we'd travel and we'd play club teams uh, in American football. Just had a great time. I did that for like 25 years. Um, let's talk about your school experience. Now, in the States, uh, we have sports and athletics uh, teams through the school system, but in England, um, it's very much, uh, I, I think, a club setup. Uh, you know, what was your experience like when you were in the, you know, 14, 15, 16 year old age? Were you involved in any sports clubs at all? Yeah, so you're right. I think my um, physical activity at school was probably quite low. Um, not me personally, but just in terms of what was on offer. Um and when I moved to what we call secondary school, which is um, year eight for us, I guess that's age 12, I want to say, 11, 12, something, maybe a little bit older, 13. Um, in that secondary school period, I don't think I did really anything at school. I think we had a mandatory one or two PE lessons a week. Um, but where I kind of kept outside of school, I was part of a gymnastics um, club. So 
I had done a lot of gymnastics, um, trained to a very high level. And then actually around that time, I suddenly had a growth spurt. I found gymnastics a lot harder. I think probably maybe thought sport was a bit less cool. I'm not sure what my thought processes were, but I was fortunate enough that the club um, really kind of picked me under their wings and um, got me into the coaching routes. And so I started coaching at that age and I spent a lot of my time outside of school um, at the club, coaching the younger children in the evenings and in the weekends. Um, and I think that was something that I'm very fortunate to have had because I think it taught me loads, which I think is very transferable for my job now. Um, but also that experience, I think, is is quite unique. And I think had it not been for that, I would have probably dropped out of physical activity altogether at that age, um, which now looking back, I think would have been a real shame. And I think it's certainly something we see. One of the reasons we put together the programme is um, around trying to you know, empower and educate, um, you know, not just the teachers and the coaches, but also the students and the young um, women and, and men um, in terms of why that change maybe occurs and what we can do to overcome some of those boundaries and barriers to getting or maintaining activity for women and and girls in school. Absolutely. Boy, you're, you're preaching to the choir. I know our listeners are, are thinking the same thing. You know, th that's a big reason that that sports exist to make those connections, to keep kids involved. You know, not that we're training kids for the Olympics, although sometimes that happens, but to give them some uh, uh, positive experiences in physical activity so they can hopefully continue you know, in for the rest of their life when they're no longer with a, a sports club. You know, very cool stuff. For our listeners, uh, our guest today is Jenny Fielding. She's the Director of Women's Health for Joint Dynamics Evolve, and that's in England. She's also going to be part of a webinar. We're going to hear more about that webinar later on, but let's take our first break. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to say thanks to Home Campus for their support of the podcast. Home Campus is the exclusive high school and information management platform. It's also your one-stop platform for scheduling and student-athlete clearance and a whole lot more. As a high school AD, I used Home Campus every day, and the Home Campus team was just great to work with. To find out more about what Home Campus can do for you and your program, go to homecampus.com. That's homecampus.com. We also want to say thanks to Gipper. Go to Gipper.com and start creating custom content for your school's social media channel. You can do it in seconds on any device. You can celebrate your teams, promote your programs. Gipper's used by over 3,000 athletic programs, both colleges and high schools. And it's so easy, even I can do it. Go to Gipper.com. Mention the podcast. You'll get a nice discount. That's Gipper.com. Hey, welcome back to the Educational AD Podcast. Once again, our guest is Jenny Fielding. She's the Director of Women's Health for Joint Dynamics Evolve, and that's in London. Jenny, you kind of shared with us, um, you know, your background growing up and, um, you know, uh, taking those exams. Um, let's talk a little bit, or you talk a little bit about your early career and some of the different stops that have led to your position now with Joint Dynamics. Yeah, so I, I mean, I started, I think it's quite commonplace in the UK, I started in the NHS system. Um, and we work in lots of different fields. So you do three or four months in different areas. Um, I absolutely love the intensive care environment. So working with the medical team and in a very collaborative approach, um, and the physiotherapy role in that in space is really around the respiratory system. So helping young children on a ventilator with their breathing troubles and things. Um, and I, I was quite adamant I would never end up in what we call the musculoskeletal field, which is kind of sports physio. Um, I felt like it was a bit bit dull, um, you know, managing injuries when there was these very kind of, I guess, life-threatening, um, life-changing, you know, scenarios where I felt like I added a lot more value. Um, and so it was interesting. That's that's where I sort of went for a while. Um, and then perhaps as I matured um, and realize some of the restrictions around working in only the NHS environment real meaning that I would you know not necessarily have as much flexibility or freedom that I might like in my life or in my travel opportunities um I looked at it maybe a bit differently um I was really lucky to get offered um 
to do a six month placement or you know working placement in the musculoskeletal team and found that it was much more rewarding than I had realized um and so I did that um and then I then I actually took some time out to to travel and I was really lucky I got offered to go to a ski season um ski resort and work as a physiotherapist so I taught Pilates and I did um physiotherapy on the sort of slopes in a clinic um whilst also getting to ski a huge amount um so that was really great and then I wasn't quite ready to go back to the real world so I spent then the summer doing the same in a windsurfing resort um looking after windsurfers and guests who would come there on holiday um and I think that's really for me when I probably fully converted into the different type part of the physiotherapy realizing that you know I guess probably some of those um gender stereotypical um ideas that eventually I may not be able to work full time with if I wanted children um and you know maybe I you know all of those sorts of things I guess I realized this gave me opportunity um and then I worked actually for the ballet so I traveled with a ballet company called Matthew Bourne and um, he's a fairly well renowned international choreographer he did the first all male cast Swan Lake I mean they had female in the cast but the, the swans were all men um and then I settled, as it were, back in London in a sports injury clinic um, and was kind of all set to be sensible and buy a house and be sort of in that sort of physio world. Um, I had a really good job. And then I met my now husband who said, I think I fancy, he's a teacher, in fact, um, and he wanted to go and work and live somewhere different, um, you know, a bit of experience, hopefully a leg up on the career ladder and also to um, some money hopefully and save so we could one day buy property so that's what we did and we settled on Hong Kong because I was very adamant it had to be a location that um, I had a career prospect as well um, so we did and we moved there for two years and then eight years later we have just left um, so yeah I, I worked in a originally a company I, I wasn't so happy with um there wasn't a really very much emphasis on professional development and um, there wasn't much collaboration in the team um they didn't feel like there was much career progression and opportunity for me um so once we decided to stay longer i was really lucky to come across joint dynamics um they are run by um run and owned by a group who are uh, australian and british um they've been based there for 10 years now and they have a really um, collaborative approach to everything that they do. Um, it's a multidisciplinary space. They have physiotherapy, osteopathy, sports therapy, um, personal trainers, psychologists, the nutrition, um, and lots of emphasis on professional development. And so I was really grateful to be able to get a role there. Um, and again, I love that. And then I sort of accidentally um, started doing some of the women's health. Um, my, I guess you'd call her my first mentor, a lady called Susie Williams. Um, she set up the idea that women's health physiotherapy was really needed. Um, she was from Australia and actually Australia is much further ahead than certainly the UK and, and obviously Hong Kong in terms of, um, you know, women's health, pelvic health physiotherapy. Um, so I was really lucky to work alongside her and then um, I fell pregnant with my first child and I did um, some training down in Australia in women's health physiotherapy and I think that was really when for me that was a huge career changing moment. Um, I had never done a physiotherapy course where 90% of the course was of, of interest. Um, you know often if I would go and do an update of a certain um, injury or something you might have repetition for 70 percent of it and there might be a few little nuggets of information that made it worthwhile spending the weekend there but this was the first time I thought that everything I learned was of, of interest and fascinating but also how did I not know any of that because it was all about the female body and um, female anatomy female hormonal health and um, pregnancy the postnatal recovery journey um, perimenopause menopause breast health just really fascinating to me that as a you know someone with a good academic career to date and lots of experience in sport and different coaching environments had never come across any of this information really um to the level of depth that the course delivered so that was when it all changed um and we realized there was a huge gap in the market for this and a huge need for women um or those identifying as women 
and we decided to branch out the joint dynamics into this sister business called Joint Dynamics Evolve. Um, Susie Williams, the lady I mentioned, she moved back to Australia and so I set up the business um, alongside Joint Dynamics and then grew the team to now we have 15 in the team, um, multidisciplinary um, members. And it's really, as far as I'm aware, one of the only places like that in Hong Kong um, that focuses on, on women's health. Um, so that's that's the journey, I guess. Um, and then I had further children and more of my own personal women's health challenges, I guess. Um, and I think Evolve has become, I don't know if we thought about it perhaps as much, but it has become such a topical name because the whole um, delivery of what we do and, you know, the service has, has evolved. And I think our understanding of what we needed to be doing and also what people needed um, and all of our own personal journeys have all evolved. And I think that's what makes it such a unique uh, business model, really. Um, so, yeah, that's my very long, sorry, um, story about how I got to where I am now. No, and again, that's exactly you know what we want to hear. And you used a couple of different words, different times. Uh, you you talked about journey, and you talked about the name of your business, evolve, and how appropriate it was to the things that you're doing. Um, you know, just on a, a very tight focus. You know, if you talk about you know maybe exercise or something, a lot of people who don't exercise, um, they start and they think it's going to be for three weeks or four weeks, then, okay, I don't have to exercise anymore, but no, it's, it's a journey and you're evolving. You're doing different things and same with nutrition and, and the whole gamut of, uh, of health. Uh, you know, you talk about your team, you know, you have different experts, uh, that work in different areas and we're going to hear more about that, but no, very cool. Uh, uh, I, I do want to, uh, ask you one thing back in your earlier, uh, journey where you were, um, you know, uh, windsurfing and skiing. And uh, you mentioned one other thing. It was just great. Uh, as those tourists and as those people would come in for a week or two or, or whatever, they're probably looking at you saying, she's got the greatest job in the world. She gets to do this all the time. Uh, at the time, did you feel that way? Did you feel like you had the greatest job in the world? I mean, I was very lucky. Um even on resort compared to the bar staff or the chalet staff on ski resort um <laughs> we had the easiest hours um you know I was lucky that I was doing actually what I genuinely loved I was already doing my career you know lots of my friends there were were doing jobs maybe they weren't so invested in purely to get the experience of being on a season um and being able to ski a lot or windsurf a lot so yeah I think it was it was amazing I mean tiring um but really a very great experience um and yeah I think you know if I lived another life and didn't have family and children I mean my husband and I always talked about before we had children you know maybe one day going and doing a chalet again or something but um but no I think it's certainly it's a young person's game I think that industry but it was great well right now you're you're in chapter two uh, of your book. I'm in chapter three, you know, the retirement. So when you get to chapter three, that's when you can go back with your husband and do those types of things, you know, and you'll be working yeah, with true. a completely different uh, uh, clientele, you know, a, a different age group, and you're still going to be more fit than 99% uh, of them. For our listeners, uh, our guest today is Jenny Fielding. She's the director of women's health for Joint Dynamics Evolve, and that's in London. And until recently, it had just been in Hong Kong. We're going to take another break, but we're coming back with some more. So please stay with us. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to say thanks to Huddle for their support of the podcast. Go to huddle.com and change the way you see the game. As a football coach, I used Huddle for years, and it was just fantastic. But when I became an athletic director, I made sure that our school was a Huddle school. And our coaches just loved the tools that Huddle provided that allowed them to coach our kids at the highest level. Go to Huddle.com, see why we believe in sports and teams believe in Huddle. Join the 6 million users and turn your school into a Huddle school. We also want to say thanks to Vital Signs Wall of Fame. You know, they're on a mission to bring your school's legacy to life. 
Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com and check out their interactive touchscreen video consoles. It's a great way to display your school record boards for all the teams, for all the events, or your school's Hall of Fame, or to just tell more compelling stories and celebrate your school's diverse history and your proudest moments. Go to vitalsignswalloffame.com. Mention the podcast. They'll give you a nice discount. That's vitalsignswalloffame.com. And we want to say thank you to District 1. Go to district1.com, that's W-O-N, and you're going to feel like you've won when you see their custom uniforms, their on-time delivery, and their one-at-a-time replacement program. You're never going to have to buy a full set of uniforms again when you just need one or two replacements. Go to district1.com, click on the Team Gear button, and you'll get a nice discount. That's district1.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational 80 Podcast. Jenny, one of the things we try to do with the podcast is this idea of sharing best practices. So I'm going to put you on the spot. You've been in a lot of different organizational settings, both as a leader and probably working with people who are providing leadership. What are some best practices that you have seen or maybe that you use in your own business that you can share with our listeners? Uh, Anything come to mind? Yeah, so um, it's a really good question and actually a really hard one. Um, I would say certainly my personal journey in leadership has probably been one of the most challenging parts of my career in as much as as a physiotherapist um, by trade and obviously by degree, I feel like the business side um, and the person people management side is not something that there's any ever any formal learning on. Um, and certainly my focus in my career has often been very much on the clinical skill set, um, constantly, you know, maintaining up to date research, developing my practice, learning new skills, developing the practices skills in terms of the rest of the team um, and kind of constantly striving to do that. And I think the management of people and leadership and sort of business strategy is certainly something that I very much have learned on the job Um, and through, you know, exposure to watching other people lead, as you say, um, and making a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, In terms of best practice, I don't know if I can answer. I can tell you what I um, have learned in terms of what I think rather than these may well not be the best practices that a very experienced leader would agree with. Um, but in my experience to date, I would say um, having a collaborative approach. Um, when I started in as a leader, I think I always felt I needed to have the answers. Um, and probably I always needed to have all the suggestions and all the solutions and all the ideas and that everyone would follow along in line, as it were. Um, as I've evolved as a leader, I think uh, my approach has changed so drastically um, in that now I really try to foster what the staff want, um, empower them to follow their own pathways, really try and understand them as in as individuals in terms of their strengths and weaknesses, um, and really just try and fact find a lot more. I think I felt when in my junior leadership time that someone coming to my office with a problem meant I had to solve it um, and I think that has definitely been something that I've changed a lot and um, so if I guess if I were to frame that as best practice I would say it would yeah be having an active listening approach um, empowering your staff um, and giving staff ownership um, and I think in that as well I try not to sweat the small things you know some things that maybe are important to me that aren't always important to everybody and I think if they're not necessarily business important or if you can't explain why they're important it's just a personal preference then sometimes perhaps accepting those things don't always matter um when you're a bit of a control freak or a bit of a you know organizer um people will have a different way to do things and I think that understanding that has is definitely um is something that I think I've I've, I've reflected upon um I think the other thing that I have found from people who have managed me um, that I've really valued and really um, respected has been uh, around transparency. So um, explaining why um, upskilling, you know, individuals to understand not just 
the black and white around the decision making, but all the grey, all the whys, all the thought processes and having that much more kind of, you know, we don't know the answer here. Um, these are all the pros to this decision. These are all the cons. This is what could work. This is what couldn't. Um, and really sharing that that thought process um, is something that I personally feel has given me a, a, so much opportunity to learn as a leader. Um, and so I try to do that in as a leader myself. But yeah, I think they would be the the sort of, I guess if I would summarize them, transparency, um, a collaborative approach, empowerment, of your staff and making sure they feel ownership um and then of course you know having your own upholding your own standards and ensuring that you are also setting a very good example um and you know working as hard as you expect your staff if not much harder um and you know that be it doing the, the small jobs no one wants to do you know being happy to do anything whatever that may be you know sticking labels on envelopes or whatever the task is um yeah, sorry, that's a bit of a jumbled up answer. I'm set, you can see I've had no formal leadership training. This is very much make it up as I've gone along. <laughs> no, a, a, as you were ticking those off, um, every single one is something that, you know, a, athletic directors were saying, yep, yep, you know, yeah, that's a best practice. So uh, the first one you led with about um, realizing as a leader, that you might not have all the answers instantly, but you know we're going to try to find that answer. Uh, I I share the story. Listening was one of the skills, a very important skill that I learned way too late in my career. Um, a parent would come in, and of course they're concerned about their child's lack of playing time on the soccer team or the basketball team, uh, but sometimes they're not looking for an answer. They just came in and they just wanted to vent. And early yeah. on in my career, I wouldn't give them a chance to vent. I would jump in and, and try to find six or seven different solutions to a problem that really didn't exist. Uh, and, you know, they would leave my office frustrated because I never gave them a chance to vent. So uh, uh, yeah. that's what that popped into my head as you were talking about that, you know, not feeling like you have to have all the answers. Yeah, and I guess for, in physiotherapists, you know, again, when as a junior physio with clients, I would always feel I had to have the answers, you know, I have to be able to diagnose their problem, I have to tell them exactly what's going to be the treatment plan. And certainly my practice with clients has evolved a lot too, you know, I now it's much more collaborative, I'm very open about, you know, well, these things point towards it being this, these point towards this, generally this, you know, what, what path do you feel is going to suit your lifestyle the best, and we kind of make a much more patient-centered experience and I think it's taken me a bit longer to do the same with staff um and probably it's in fear isn't it of feeling as someone's leader their boss that's telling them in, in certain scenarios what they're supposed to do that you should know um a bit like when you're a junior physio that you should know exactly what's wrong with them and as you become more experienced in both those facets you you realize that 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 isn't necessarily the the sign of a of a good physio or of a good leader no, you're absolutely right. Uh, again, being confident enough to say, you know, hey, that's a great question. I don't know the answer, but I'm going to find out for you. You know, yeah. Jenny, we're going to do yeah. this. Um, we'll do this later in the podcast as well. But if one of our listeners wanted to reach out, find out more about uh, Joint Dynamics Evolve, or even just pick your brain a little bit, what's the best way that one of our listeners can get a hold of you? Well, it's a good question. And um, you mentioned a few times that Joint Dynamics evolves in London. So it's all a little convoluted at the moment. Joint Dynamics and the main business, Joint Dynamics Evolve, where the women's health is, is all based in Hong Kong um, and has just expanded into London in collaboration with a company called Mint Wellbeing. Um, I have now come over to join the team at Mint um, to develop the women's health service there, which will then be in the short term called Evolve at Mint. Um, so the best place is probably via Instagram. Um, you can contact me either on my personal, so at Jenny Fielding One, um, or on either of the business platforms. So at Joint Dynamics Evolve is the Hong Kong page. Um, if I don't answer it, it would certainly be directed towards me. Um, or at Evolve underscore Mint. 
um, which will be the London page. And so the two businesses are very connected. They're just in different countries. Um, I oversee the Hong Kong branch with a great team over there who do all the leadership um, day to day. And then the the London side of it is in its infancy. So we're just um, growing that Um and then, yeah, until I'm a little bit more settled up right now, I don't have the UK number or my things set up on this side. So that's probably, honestly, the best way for people to get in touch with me direct. No worries at all. So, again, we'll do that at the end of the uh, podcast. But uh, at Jenny Fielding one, that's her uh, uh, Instagram. That's my personal. So, yeah. Uh, we're going to take another break. But when we come back, uh, Jenny's going to take us on a deep dive into the webinar that we promised you, uh, Optimizing Adolescent Female Health Education. That's coming up on September 13th. She's going to tell you all about it, why you should attend it, and how to get signed up. So let's take that break. This is the Educational AD Podcast. We want to thank Hometown Ticketing for their support of the podcast Go to hometownticketing.com. Hometown's the leading digital ticketing platform for schools and colleges. And Hometown Ticketing offers more. If you go to hometownticketing.com, they're going to show you how to set up and sell tickets for all of your events, not just athletic events, but things like school plays, concerts, school dances, even graduation. And here's the best part. Every step of the way, Hometown's going to provide a dedicated client success manager to give you hands-on support every step of the way. Hometown Ticketing, more support, more security, and more customization. Go to hometownticketing.com and get signed up today. We want to say thank you to Snap Mobile. Go to snapraise.com. Check out their entire suite of platforms designed to help you do your job better. If you're looking for a fundraising platform, stop right here. Snap Raise is hands down the best one out there. But there's a lot more. There's Snap Connect, Snap Store, Snap Manage. Go to snapraise.com. Check them all out today. And we want to say thank you to Sideline Interactive Indoor Score Tables and Video Boards. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Schedule a live web demo and see their score tables and their score boards uh, in action. Probably one of the best purchases I ever made was our Sideline Interactive Indoor Score Table. We used it for home games, of course, but we also used it for pep rallies, for signing ceremonies. Their products are tremendously versatile, and their customer service is just outstanding. Go to sidelineinteractive.com. Schedule that live web demo today. Welcome back, everyone, to the Educational AD Podcast. Our guest is Jenny Fielding. She's the Director of Women's Health for Joint Dynamics Evolve. Jenny, we've been uh, telling our listeners that there's a big webinar coming up, and the topic is Optimizing Adolescent Female Health Education. A lot of our uh, athletic directors who listen are still in the classroom. Um, probably all of them uh, supervise or are looking for some professional development opportunities for coaches who teach for them. So tell us a little bit about the webinar, um, what it's going to cover, and, and just as important, how they can get signed up for it. Yeah, so thank you. It's um, This is a bit of a passion project that started initially. Um, we did some research in Hong Kong international schools around, um, you know, female health. Um, there'd been there's been obviously a lot of in recent years around menstrual health um, and around the idea of maybe syncing our exercise with our menstrual cycle, understanding different injury risks at different phases of the menstrual cycle. Um, you know, and I think there's definitely more education around the menstrual health in general. Um, but in the UK, as part of the NICE guidance, there's also now the push to get a pelvic health education out into schools and into the age group, 14 to 16 year old girls. Um, and I think the reasoning behind it is multifactorial. Um, we see a massive drop off of girls in sport at that sort of age. Um, a lot of that is down to barriers in terms of body image um, menstrual health and period care period cramps, uh, misinformation around whether exercise is safe during your period um, and sort of not understanding the menstrual cycle in their bodies on one hand. Also around clothing, you know, you'll notice Wimbledon this year allowed the women to wear black um, under shorts um, 
you know, another huge barrier to a professional athlete. Can you imagine it's that time of the month and that's something you're having to think about whilst you're also trying to perform at a high level. Um, but also bra fits, the importance of bra fit and breast support for women in terms of, you know, bra discomfort is, I think, the fourth um, sort of highest rated barrier to girls continuing to participate in sport and exercise. Um, quite an awkward topic to maybe discuss um and just just the same as pelvic health you know women who are leaking urine and um, 14 15 16 year old girls and they do trampolining or gymnastics and um, they don't want to wear certain clothing and they're not sure whether that's normal or not normal and I think what we did we screened a lot of the international schools and um, and we asked the teachers around whether they taught certain topics and also how confident they were to teach certain topics and also if they were interested to teach certain topics um, and the results were really really amazing and um, the teachers kind of passion and interest for the topics was really high but their confidence and their knowledge base was generally quite low um, and so that's where we felt like we are naturally placed to help plug this gap um, and so we started working with Hong Kong schools um, and then have through Justin um, started to get that word out into a more international forum um, because there's just been so much interest in it so the, the idea behind the conference is really to give some context to that information and um, to share some of the more evidence based um, understanding around things like, you know, I'm sure you'll see all over social media, the menstrual cycle being synced to our exercise. And some of this has been, you know, a little bit um, sound bites, shall we say, of certain pieces of research that maybe aren't fully understood. So we try to really explain why these things come out and what they mean. Um, and then a big part of the, the workshop is actually lessons. Um, so we deliver um, lessons with resources and actual activities, um, obviously online. So we, we talk about how those activities could be done in a more interactive way. Um, but we actually get the, the teachers on the conference um, to to do the lessons um, so they really hopefully leave the conference feeling really equipped to cover topics like menstrual health and um, pelvic health and um, you know talking to boys and girls about you know toilet behavior about you know this idea of being forced to go to the toilet just in case or you know how we can set up toilet environments at school to mean that people are happy to have their bowel open in a school environment because we know constipation is a huge um you know factor of urinary incontinence and also just general discomfort and nutritional and gut health and all these kinds of things. Um, so the idea behind it is to talk about some of these taboo topics, explain why we care, um, and then make it a really practical resource. And um, we have a resource pack that the teachers who attend go away with. Um, so they can, the idea should be they leave and they can actually implement at least three 20 minute lessons immediately into their school environment um, on some of these topics. Um, and I believe that as part of the phased conference, there's also the option to be um, accredited so you can actually get a certification. Um, so we do a little piece at the end where um, teachers will implement something into their own school environment and, and have a one to one feedback session with one of us um, to, yeah, to, to achieve that certification. So that's wow. the premise. Um, no, that was great. Um, I, I, I appreciate what you were able to share there. And, you know, it's not just content, but you just said there's going to be lessons and, and application of a lot of the information. Um, I'm going to guess, uh, maybe I'm going to hope that also included, it's going to be an opportunity for the participants to, you know, network and make some connections with teachers or coaches or ADs or physiotherapists, you know, maybe in different parts of the country. Uh, is that uh, a planned part or is that just something they all are going to be able to try to do on their own? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there are there's a lot of interaction in terms of breakout rooms um, to encourage more communication in smaller audiences. In terms of sharing people's personal details, obviously, there's confidentiality um, challenges around sharing everybody's contact details. Um, but I'm sure Justin has something cleverly set up in that space um, for those who want to, um, to allow you to join some kind of, you know, networking platform or share, you know, contact details. Um, I'm sure lots of lots of the teachers certainly in Hong Kong are already part of different networks in that case, but I believe this goes out to the whole of APAC and beyond. I mean, anyone can join, um, time zone dependent, I guess. Um, and I think there will probably be a recording option as well, but that's something I would have to check. 
I, I do remember the original email where Justin connected the two of us. Uh, he did make the comment, you know, that this podcast was going out to exactly the people that they wanted to reach, you know, in the United States. So uh, we're going to do our part. And for listeners, yeah. if you're wondering how to get signed up, you know, the webinar is, is going to be September 13th. Um, I'm going to uh, put a link. Jenny has uh, shared a link. I'm going to put it in the show notes. And that's your pathway to get signed up to find out all the details about the uh, webinar, Optimizing Adolescent Female Health Education. Sounds like a terrific program. Uh, you definitely want to share this with your coaches, your teachers, and, you know, all the the, the people in your district, I'm sure. Uh, Jenny, this is... Uh, just been great spending some time with you. Uh, hopefully you're going to get over to the States uh, and we can connect over here. You know, come to Florida. Uh, with the yeah, I'd love to. Um, but we're not done yet. Uh, we always wrap up with a segment we call the Athletic Director's Toolbox. Now, you're not an athletic director, but you certainly, you know, been around, uh, you know, the world of fitness and health and sports. Uh, so we're going to take our final break. And when we come back, I'm going to challenge you to send out a brand new, and we can call them a new athletic director, a new leader, a, a new coach, uh, maybe even a new physiotherapist. Uh, but I'm only going to let you put three things in their toolbox. Uh, let's do that final uh, shout out for a sponsor, and then we'll find out what Jenny Fielding will put in her new athletic director toolbox. We want to thank Athletic Surveys for sponsoring the AD Toolbox segment. Athletic Surveys are a quick, easy, and an affordable way for you to collect comprehensive data that allows you to evaluate and improve your entire athletic program. Athletic directors usually only hear back from the complainers, the 2% that want to gripe about everything. Well, athletic surveys will connect you with the 2%, but they'll also connect you with the 98% of your parents and student athletes that really love and support your program. And that's a tremendously valuable tool to have when you're talking with a frustrated parent or your school board or your principal. Go to athleticsurveys.com. They're going to create a custom survey for your school that lets you take the pulse of your parents and your student athletes. That's athleticsurveys.com. Make sure you check them out today. Well, it's that time of the podcast. We've been visiting today, and it's been a great visit. Really enjoyed this with Jenny Fielding. She's the Director of Women's Health for Joint Dynamics Evolve. Uh, she's got an incredible background on uh, the world of health and fitness and training, physiotherapy. But right now, I'm going to challenge her to send out a brand new athletic director or a brand new leader. I'm only going to let her put three things in that toolbox. So, Jenny, what three items are going to go into your new athletic director toolbox? Uh, thank you. So, yeah, tricky question. Um, I think the first tool, as it were, that I would put into my toolbox would be um, a mentor. So, obviously, maybe you can't carry them around with you, but having somebody that is in your field or often even not in your field but someone outside of your organization, outside of your the world that you're working in, um, that you can have as a support to help guide you through um, as you sort of evolve into your leadership role. And really, I think just to help um, bounce ideas, have someone challenging you um, and your ideas, but also someone with a very different perspective. So I guess maybe not quite at all, but that would be one thing that I wish I had put into place earlier. No, and again, uh, I this may surprise you or it may not, but uh, having a mentor is one of our top three uh, most frequently mentioned uh, tool categories. So you're spot on. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, number two is more of a tip than a tool. Um, but for me, one thing that I found really helpful, um, and actually it was a psychologist who we have in our team who I talked to about some, you know, challenging um, staff discussions and something she said that has really stuck with me and made a big difference is don't plan your answer. Um, so I think 
kind of alluding back to what we discussed earlier in leadership when you think you should know everything and have all the answers um someone emails you saying oh I've got some question marks about this and I want to have a meeting tomorrow um I the old me would be imagining all the potential scenarios that person's bringing to my office having tried to problem solve all of them and then a little bit like you mentioned earlier maybe not actually listening um to what that person comes into my office wanting to discuss so trying not to plan um your answer would be another big tip that I wish I had been given you know five or ten years ago in this role yeah well, uh, you're two for two. You're killing it. So uh, I'm excited. What's your third uh, toolbox tip? Uh, this is a slightly different one. Um, I would in this space, for me, it's having rules, of course, like have rules, have processes, have your standard operating procedures, have your policies, etc. cetera, um, but accept some gray. So I think certainly working in an entrepreneurial business um, like um, like our joint, our joint dynamics evolve is, um, you know, it's you really want to have those rules and regulations and procedures on absolutely everything. But certainly when it comes to managing staff or growing areas of a business, um, hopefully what makes you innovative is that you're always doing things that haven't been done before. And as such, you wouldn't have the answers um, yet and you won't have a policy or a procedure in place. Um, and I think that gives you really the freedom to you know, think about employing slightly different staff from a different skill set that you maybe wouldn't have otherwise or to grow an area of the business that maybe doesn't immediately feel like it sits in the right spot or to develop a class that suits your clients in a slightly alternative way. So that for me is something else, I guess, like move outside of the black and white. And whilst it's important to be professional and have all your procedures and your policies in place, that ability to to look at things differently and accept um, a bit of mess in there, I think is um, is something that I have I found hard to do initially, but I have found really really beneficial. Well, I, I'm right there with you. Uh, you know, I, I was very much a you know between the lines kind of guy, and you know, learned to uh, uh, you know expand. And uh, I, I love your term there, have grace. You know, have your rules, but but have grace. Uh, very cool. Jenny, this has been so cool. Uh, appreciate you spending some time with us. I know you're incredibly busy. Um, one more time, if one of our listeners wanted to reach out and connect with you, find out more about uh, your program, what's the best way they can do it? Uh, at the moment, it would be via Instagram. So just feel free to message me um, at Jenny with a Y, Fielding one, J-E-N-N-Y, Fielding, F-I-E-L-D-I-N-G, and the number one. And uh, for our listeners, um, we were we will put the link to the webinar, Optimizing Adolescent Female Health Education, coming up on September 13th. The link, all the information to get signed up will be in the show notes. So make sure you check that out. Jenny, thanks again for being with us and uh, all the best uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. For our listeners, uh, we appreciate you tuning in and uh, we upload the Zoom recordings of all of our interviews to the Educational AD Podcast YouTube channel. We appreciate you tuning in today. Come back next time for another great interview on the Educational AD Podcast. We'll see you next time.